Well, uh, thank you all for uh, thank you all for joining today. Um, I was uh, asked to say a bit about uh, our recent uh, our recent research about uh, how the microbiome transforms your food into you, and how you literally are what you eat. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a bit about what the microbiome is, uh, how we find out about it, and some of the remarkable relationships we've seen out just recently uh, with an army of collaborators. Uh, in Peter Darastein and Metabolomics, but also uh, also many others in understanding uh, what it is that microbes are doing in terms of transforming our food and how it impacts our health. So when we think about our bodies uh, at the level of cells, um, we we think of that as being a uh, being a dissimilar, a dissimilar complex organism, right? So each of us has about 30 trillion human cells, which is a lot. But astonishingly, we have about 39 trillion microbial cells, mostly bacteria in the gut. So if you think about it that way, just counting up all the cells that are on, uh, that are on your body uh, or in your body and asking, is it a human cell or a microbial cell? You come to this astonishing conclusion that we're only 43% human in terms of counting up all the cells. Now, you might think... Uh, Sorry, I see some chat messages. Um, let me let me just see if I need to pay attention to any of those. The chat. They're all about who said man is what he eats, and the consensus. Oh, all right. Well, I, I will I will ignore that and just uh, and, and just keep on talking. I just wanted to make sure there weren't additional technical issues I didn't know about. So we've got thirty trillion human cells and thirty nine trillion microbial cells, mostly bacteria in the gut. And so by that measure, you can say we're just forty three percent human. And that's pretty remarkable, but you might wonder, uh, you know, it's the 21st century, should we really be doing this by counting cells? Shouldn't we think about it in terms of our DNA now that the Human Genome Project has been done, the Human Microbiome Project has been done? And when we think about it at the DNA level, at the level of genes, it becomes even more astonishing. So you probably remember the big result from the Human Genome Project, which is mapping the full human genome results in a count of about 20,000 human genes that we all share. But uh, astonishingly, large-scale sequencing projects like MetaHit, the Human Microbiome Project, and others have shown that the size of the gene catalog in our microbiome is more like 2 to 20 million microbial genes. And so by that count, if we're counting up the genes instead of the cells, you could say that at best, we're just 1% human. And what's most amazing and most shocking about this is, uh, is, is not just that we're ignoring most of the genes in our body when we focus on the human genome, but the ones that we ignore, the 99% that we ignore, are the genes that we can change. And each of us has changed this gene repertoire dramatically throughout the course of our life, uh, just through the process of the development of the bacteria in our gut, in our mouths, in our skin, over the rest of the body. But what's really exciting is the prospect that we can take control over this process of change in a very individualized way and use it to modify our health to improve it over a lifetime. Now, I mentioned that the vast majority of these microbial cells and these microbial genes are from bacteria in the gut. Uh, but it's important to remember that the gut is not vagus and that what happens in the gut does not stay in the gut. And those microbes and those genes influence processes all throughout the body. And we're just starting to appreciate the impact of the microbiome on a whole lot of different physiological processes around the body, including processes in health, ranging from things like uh, the microbiome's basic role in digestion, uh, its help in maturing the immune system, its effect on brain development and behavior, and its effect in protection and clearance of, of pathogens. So for example, whether you're susceptible to viruses, ranging from flu to COVID, depends in great amount on what bacteria you have in the gut. But the microbiome also has a, trem a tremendous number of negative effects. So for example, it can contribute to a range of different diseases, including uh, uh, kidney disease, uh, metabolic syndromes like diabetes and obesity, GI disorders, and uh, the development, not just colon cancer as shown in this figure, but of cancer throughout the body. Um, now, at the same time, uh, there's uh, a whole lot of things that have an impact on the microbiome, making it an incredibly sensitive data recorder of things that have happened to you throughout your life. And these include things like how you were born, what you were fed right after, uh, right after birth, and then, um, and, and then how you continue to be fed as an adult, uh, various disease processes, uh, how old you are and the process of your aging, uh, what drugs you're taking, and where you live. 
and uh, and so the microbiome contains a whole lot of information about all these and more. And it's important we study the microbiome right at the moment because we're uh, undergoing a global microbial biodiversity crisis at the moment. And I'm sure you're all familiar with Rachel Carson's classic work uh, from the 1960s, where in her book, Silent Spring, she documented how uh, major, uh, major features of the ecosystems uh, around us, uh, like the bird life, for example, was literally disappearing due to the use of DDT and other pesticides to try to control single insect pest species in agriculture. Uh, my good friend and colleague Marty Blazer, who's now at Rutgers, wrote a wonderful book a few years ago called Missing Microbes, documenting something similar for the inner ecosystems inside us. And although what made the cover was how the overuse of antibiotics is depleting the gut microbial diversity, he documents in the book all kinds of other factors that also reduce the complexity of our, of our gut microbiomes, ranging from increased use of C-section to low-fiber diets to increased consumption of uh, artificial sweeteners and ultra-processed foods. And all of these things have an impact on our gut microbiome. And to understand uh, whether this matters, uh, Marty's fond of showing these two graphs side by side, and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine 20 years ago. And uh, on the left-hand side, you can see how one organism after another that's a pathogen that causes disease, uh, ranging from measles to tuberculosis, declined dramatically due to advances in medicine and advances in public health. But on the other hand, all kinds of non-communicable non diseases, uh, ranging from inflammatory bowel disease to multiple sclerosis, skyrocketed over the same period on the graph on the right. And what amazes me is that when this was published, none of the four chronic diseases on that graph on the, on, on the right was even suspected to have anything to do with the human microbiome. Whereas today, we know that all four of those and dozens of others are associated with the microbiome in humans. So you might be wondering, does all this diversity in the microbiome really matter? And one thing my lab has worked on with a number of collaborators, notably Jeff Gordon at Washington University, but uh, also dozens of others over the years, is obesity. And today I can tell you with about 90% accuracy, whether you're lean or obese, with about 90% accuracy, just looking at the DNA of the bacteria in your gut. So on the one hand, this is a really cool trick from a technical perspective. On the other hand, we don't think it has a lot of clinical or commercial significance as a diagnostic test for obesity, because I bet you can tell which of these people is obese without doing any DNA sequencing at all, right? But on the other hand, if you try to do that classification test, lean or obese, you can only do it with 57% accuracy based on human genes using all of the latest machine learning techniques that we have available versus the 90% accuracy that you can get from microbial genes. And uh, this is just to show you that data directly. Um, so this is what happens if you take every single nucleotide polymorphism ever linked in the human genome to obesity. And the area under the curve is basically no different from chance. Whereas uh, in contrast, sweeping over different OTU thresholds, so different ways of grouping sequences uh, into, uh, in, into, into related groups, uh, what you can see is that we get an error rate of, of 0.1, which means a classifier accuracy of 90% uh, out of fairly broad sequence identities using the DNA from the human microbiome. And it's not just us. So uh, many groups, including Aran Segal's group in Israel, uh, have documented how, how, how important the microbiome is in terms of shaping uh, our response to different phenotypes in terms of our host genome. And in this paper in Nature, uh, what they found comparing genetic heritability of traits versus the microbiome association index is that the sample size that you would need to see relationships between genes and various phenotypes that are really important and related to nutrition, including, um, and including HDL cholesterol, uh, lactose consumption, uh, waist and hip circumference, glycemic status, BMI, and so on. Uh, all of these things are much more strongly associated with the microbiome than they, they are with the human genome in the same people. And this is such a strong effect that in fact, uh, for many of these studies, you could get away with, uh, with, with uh, tenfold fewer people if you wanted to find a microbiome association than if you wanted to find a, a human genetic association. Um, you do have to be careful, though, because these, uh, these associations tend to be very population-specific. And so in a study that we did with Hongwei Zhao and others uh, in southern China, looking at 7,000 people uh, who were very ethnically homogeneous um, from 14 different districts within one province, 
what we found is that although we could tell within each city who, will, who, who, who had a particular disease and who was healthy using their microbiomes, when we, trained this, when we trained the model in one city and tried to use it in other cities, uh, it didn't work very well. And you had to use the data from all of the cities except one to be able to predict who was healthy and who was sick in a new city. So taking into account regional variation is really important because people in different places have very different microbiomes. Um, and so this this idea that um, th this idea that microbial genes might be the key driver for obesity rather than human genes makes a lot of sense uh, when you think about the pace of the obesity epidemic. And what I'm going to show you here is a map from the CDC going from 1985 up through 2010. And you can see the spread of obesity throughout the United States over that period, uh, starting with less than 10% in most states, going through 20% in yellow, 25% in orange, and uh, finally 30% uh, in red. And so for obesity to spread that quickly, you can't be thinking about that in terms of human genetic change, right? Because, uh, because to see that level of change in just, um, in, in, in just 25 years, either all of the obese people would have, uh, would have had to have had a tremendous number of kids or all the lean people would have had to have had none at all. And that would have been very noticeable at a population level. So you have to look for some cause other than human genetics to explain the change in obesity. That's not to say that human genes aren't involved in obesity, but they cannot explain a change this rapid. So another map that's fascinating is this one, uh, the antibiotic prescriptions in the same year as the end of that CDC plot. And if I show you those two plots side by side, uh, you can see a tremendous concordance in the obesity rates uh, by state um, uh, with the antibiotic prescriptions per thousand people. And so this strongly suggests that the damage that we're Rob, you suddenly cut off. I suddenly heard no sound. With antibiotics that's associated with a low diversity microbiome. Um, let's see. Sorry. Uh, so, so to get to the bottom of this, we have to we we have to move beyond associations and get to causality. And uh, this is a scene uh, just setting the stage for the next part of the talk, um, where uh, where where uh, this is an antibiotic facility at Washington University, where uh, where where they're raising completely sterile mice in germ-free bubbles, um, and then if you grow the mice completely sterile you can then inoculate them with microbes that you think will have an impact on, on their phenotype. And uh, the work I'm about to describe was led by Vanessa Radara, then a very talented graduate student uh, with Jeff Gordon um, at Washington University. And uh, this was published in Science back in 2013. And essentially the experiment that, uh, that Vanessa did was, was, was a breathtakingly daring one. And uh, the question was, if you start off with these mice that are completely sterile, have absolutely no microbiome of their own, and they live in this bubble, if you transplant into them microbes from an obese person, what do you get? And the answer is that the mice gain weight tremendously fast with the microbes from an obese individual. But if instead you took the microbes from the stool of a lean individual and transplanted them into mice from the same litter that were also germ-free, those mice stayed lean. And so what's amazing about this is that you can transport, you can transplant these aspects of human phenotype even across the species boundary by transplanting the gut microbes and letting them establish in the mammalian host. And this has been done now, not just for obesity, but for a whole range of other conditions, including inflammatory bowel disease, colon cancer, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, autism, and many others. And so this starts to establish causality, at least in a mammalian model, it shows that you can transmit aspects of these phenotypes from a human into a mouse solely by transmitting the microbes that are associated with that human. And that doesn't yet establish causality in humans. We have to do additional kinds of experiments, especially prospective longitudinal studies to get at that question. But it provides, uh, it provides tremendous mechanistic evidence into what is going on and how microbes in the gut can start to regulate these processes that affect us all throughout the mammalian body and even affect the mammalian brain. Um, okay, so how do we find out about the microbiome in general? What you will see is for many different diseases, the following pathway uh, taking place, where first you see cross-sectional association studies in humans, where you'll look at some cases, and you'll look at some controls, you'll ask are their microbiomes different, and then start to find out what's different about them. Um, you then see uh, a movement to intervention studies in germ-free or conventional animal models, where it's possible to start finding out about mechanism by manipulating those animal models. 
Uh, you then see in vitro studies of mechanism via specific metabolic or immunological pathways, where a lot of this is done in the lab and tissue culture or, um, or, or uh, microbial culture. Um, and then finally, uh, you see prospective longitudinal studies in humans, where you have a pretty good intervention that you think will work, uh, where you get to measure people before you do that intervention that targets the microbiome, uh, look at the microbiome, uh, do the intervention, see how the microbiome changes, and show that that change is what leads to the, to the uh, difference in humans. Um, and uh, when, when those prospective longitudinal studies include interventions, they tend to be slow and rare because it takes a long time to get approval, and they're extraordinarily expensive to do. Although right at the moment at UCSD, um, we're doing the Microbiome Center for the Nutrition for Precision Health Project, uh, which is an NIH-funded project that leverages the All of Us infrastructure to do uh, a nutritional intervention in 10,000 people and look at, uh, look at its impact on the microbiome and on phenotype. And that's going to provide tremendously useful data for getting at a lot of these questions. So uh, coming back to that question about genotype, remember I told you that the host genotype, in humans at least, doesn't have a big impact on the microbiome. And that also turns out to be true for mice. And this is some work we did with Jake Lucis uh, at UCLA, looking at 50 different kinds of mice, 50 different genetic strains on two diets, high fat and low fat diet. And uh, if the main driver, as Jake expected, had been genotype, what you would see on this plot is a whole lot of paired dots with one red and one blue. Um, and uh, that would basically show that the genotypes separate and the dietary conditions don't matter and look the same. But that's the opposite of what you really see, where you see a huge blue cluster and a huge red cluster, which tell you that the two diets separate irrespective of genotype. Uh, this is also true of humans, as we found out with Gary Wu, Rick Bushman, Jim, and Jim Lewis at Penn, and many other collaborators where uh, in a large-scale um, study, at least for the time, where we looked at 100 people and looked at what aspects of diet uh, correlated with particular features of the bacteria in their gut, we were able to see a lot of correlations between specific microbes and things like long-term protein, uh, where you get a lot of uh, a kind of microbe called bacteroides versus carbohydrate-rich diets, where you tend to get more bacteria called Prevotella, changing the balance between two of the major groups of microbes in the gut and uh, a lot of other more detailed associations between particular dietary items as measured by food frequency questionnaire uh, and the microbiome overall. And in fact, we found that the dietary patterns were the most important thing that we measured in terms of structuring different people's microbiomes. So we thought, aha, we can translate this into an inpatient study where we'll bring people into the lab and we'll give them different diets and you should be able to make someone's microbiome look like another person's microbiome by changing their diet, right? Since diet has such a, such a big impact. Um, but unfortunately, it turned out that two weeks was not nearly long enough to do it. And so what you're seeing here is serial samples from people going on either a low-fat diet intervention or a high-fat diet intervention. And what you can see is a bunch of clusters of the same color, and each of those colors is a different person. And what you're seeing there is that basically with diet intervention, the microbiome doesn't change enough to make you look like a different person. And this has been seen very reproducibility, uh, very, very reprodu reproducibly in a lot of different uh, dietary interventions, where over the short term, you can't make yourself look like someone else with diet, which is a bit of a paradox because over the long term, over months to years, the diet is the most important thing that matters. Um, so, uh, so, so to get to the bottom of this, we, want, we launched the American Gut Project, which is our citizen science project to essentially offer anyone the chance to get their microbiome profiled and to get themselves on that microbiome map. And this is Daniel McDonald uh, telling middle school students about it uh, in, in our lab. And you can see a, you can see a lot of uh, variation in response in those kids when they're finding out exactly what we get to do with their microbiomes. But uh, a tremendous number of people have been interested. So at this point, it's a very large project for a, citizen, uh, for a citizen science initiative where we've raised millions of dollars and we've processed samples from tens of thousands of people. But uh, even with the sample set, we need to uh, we, we need to expand, which was the motivation for expanding globally uh, to uh, going beyond the American Gut Project to launch the MicroZeta initiative with the idea that it's like uh, that the microbes are a Rosetta stone for understanding the impact of, uh, of, of health uh, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for integrating health and environmental impacts and understanding how we can uh, improve our health through microbes. Uh, 
And uh, the main paper from American Gut was published in, uh, in 2018. And uh, this covered the first few thousand people. And we're working on another paper for uh, the next uh, few tens of thousands of people at the moment. So uh, what you get out of American Gut is basically you get your uh, microbiome profile. So you get a report showing what, um, what, my, uh, what microbes are most abundant in your particular gut. Uh, what's most enriched in you compared to other people, um, and then anything that's missing, that it's surprising that it's missing. And then you get a bunch of displays showing how the microbes in your gut compare to microbes on other sites in the body, uh, to people of different nationalities, and to the American Gut Project population as a whole, as well as comparisons of your taxonomic profile uh, to people of similar ages, similar diets, similar BMI, and so forth. And uh, having data on the scale, we could see a lot of relationships between the gut microbiome and, and stuff people had no idea it was associated with. So you might have expected that the diversity in your gut changes as you age, which it does. But something that's almost as statistically significant, that it changes with uh, is the number of hours of sleep that you get at night. And you might have had no idea that your microbes were involved in your sleep. But we've shown subsequently in a lot of uh, follow-up intervention studies, including with Amir Zarampar, who's a very talented junior faculty member here in the Department of Medicine, um, that microbes can alter sleep and also altering sleep can affect what microbes you have. Uh, so we can now get at this in a very mechanistic way. Uh, also, by having uh, the, same, the, the same data collected on thousands of people, uh, what we could do is we could start putting together power curves to ask how many people per group do you need in order to see an effect of a particular magnitude and start ranking the different information that we collected about people according to how big an effect it had on the microbiome. So basically how steep the curves are on this graph indicate uh, how, big an impact, um, how, how big an impact they have on the microbiome. And so you can see things like age and inflammatory bowel disease and, uh, and antibiotic use all have large effects where you need a few dozen people per group to be able to tell the difference, uh, to tell the difference between them. And then with smaller effect size, you see things like whether you're male or female, how much you sleep, uh, how much you weigh, how much you drink, uh, even how much you exercise, where you can start to get at that with thousands of people. But what fascinated us was that the steepest curve on this graph was the number of different species of plants that you ate in the, um, in, in the two weeks before you sent in your sample. And what's fascinating about that is that it has a huge impact, larger impact than age or whether you have inflammatory bowel disease or whether you're on antibiotics. And it's something that you have complete control over in terms of adopting a lifestyle where you eat a lot of different species of plants. Now, um, Jeff Bland, uh, who runs the Precision Lifestyle Medicine Institute, uh, has this quote that I, that I really like, where he likes to say that food is the language that speaks to your genes. And the idea is that your human genes are fixed at conception, but then uh, what you eat, the food that you eat, contains molecules that affect their gene expression. And we're starting to appreciate that a lot of this language is, um, is speaking to microbial genes rather than human genes, where it can affect what genes there are, as well as which ones are turned on and off. And the language of food is very much a language of color. So uh, I'm sure you've all heard about this idea that you should eat the rainbow and all of the bright colors in these fruits and vegetables uh, translate into particular molecules that have different impacts. Um, so like the lycopenoids that make the tomatoes red, the carotenoids that make the carrots, um, uh, that, that make the carrots orange, uh, the anthocyanins that make the, uh, that make the cherries purple, all of these things cash out in particular uh, brightly colored compounds. Um, Regrettably, though, if I go to the food source that's closest to my house, um, especially when I take my daughter there, she's confronted with a whole lot of bright colors. And, um, uh, but, uh, and I think it's particularly ironic that their motto is too much good stuff, because you might suspect that they've stripped out all of that good stuff from the food products that they sell, which are essentially all ultra processed, and replace them with synthetic analogs that, although they're brightly colored, have strong flavors may have completely different effects on our physiology and on our microbiome. Um, however, studying impacts of diet is really hard. And uh, this study by Darish Mazafarian and his collaborators is still, uh, I think, the largest of its type that's been done, um, even though it was published over a decade ago now. And what they did is they took 120,000 people for 20 years and tracked the effect of every food item on weight gain and weight loss. And so this is a really heroic effort, right? 120,000 people tracked over 20 years for all of the items that they ate. 
And uh, unfortunately, after all this work, what they found is going to fit in precisely with your stereotypes of what thin people eat and what fat people eat. So the food that was most associated with weight loss was this, uh, yogurt, um, although the magnitude of the effect was pretty disappointing. So each extra serving of yogurt you ate each day leads to a loss of about a third of a kilo per year. Um, so, uh, so, so, um, uh, so, so uh, less than a pound, basically. Whereas in contrast, uh, the food that was most associated with weight gain, no surprises here, it's fries. But again, the magnitude of the effect is relatively small. So each additional serving of fries per day led on average to a weight gain of about three quarters of a kilo per year. So basically what this means is that if, if you're perfectly average for the population and every single day you were going to eat an order of fries and you virtuously gave it up and you ate a, you, you ate a serving of yogurt instead, at the, at the end of exercising this force of will 365 times in a row, uh, the difference in your weight would be expected to be about two pounds, which is not very impressive, right? But what this is marking, what, what this is asking is high individual variation, where some people are going to do that substitution and they'll lose 20 pounds, but other people will do the substitution and gain like 18 pounds, and it almost all averages out when you look at a large population. Now, uh, not for not for weight, but for uh, glucose, for blood glucose, which is a lot easier to measure on a short time scale. Uh, Aran Alanav and Aran Segal and their teams at the Weissman Institute uh, published a remarkable article in Cell in 2016, um, looking at glycemic, uh, uh, looking at glycemic response. And what they did is they got 800 people and hooked them up to continuous glucose monitors and fed them a defined sequence of diet so they could look at the effect of each food item on blood glucose. And what they found was a tremendous amount of personalization. So when they averaged the, the blood glucose results for everyone in their population, they perfectly recaptured the published glycemic indexes of each food, but the personalized individual glycemic responses were totally different one person to another. So for example, uh, for some people, uh, sweet potatoes would set their blood glucose high, haywire, whereas regular potatoes were fine. But then for other people, it was exactly the opposite. And um, they measured a whole lot of stuff to find out why. But what they ultimately discovered was that uh, was that the gut microbiome explained essentially uh, all of the differences between different people. So you could train a classifier based on the gut microbiome that would tell you in intimate detail what you should and should not eat to keep your blood glucose under control. And then they proved it by recruiting a new group of 100 people and designing, uh, measuring their microbiomes and designing diets that were good or bad for each of those people based on their microbiomes with simple substitutions, like I'm telling you, with potatoes for sweet potatoes or one vegetable for another. And they found that they could take the same person and drive their blood glucose haywire or keep it under control by making those microbiome predictions about what they should eat. And uh, one of the fascinating things in this population was that a fairly large number of people uh, found out that they should eat ice cream rather than rice if they wanted to keep their blood glucose under control. And on hearing this, a lot of people think, um, wait a minute, is there a test I could do to find out if I'm in the category of people who should eat rice or people who should eat ice cream? And there is, they commercialized this test and sell it through a company called Day2, which for full disclosure, I'm on the scientific advisory board of. Um, but, uh, but, but it's amazing that you can do that sort of uh, detailed diagnostic. But then the more interesting question is, suppose I find out I'm in the group of people who should eat rice, but I want to be in the group of people who should eat ice cream, could I change my microbiome to do that? And that might sound frivolous, but it's almost exactly the same question as for drug response, where uh, there's a lot of drugs, including anti-cancer drugs like the latest checkpoint inhibitors, where whether you're a responder or a non-responder depends on your microbiome. And uh, figuring out, can you move someone from a non-responder category to a responder category is literally a matter of life or death. So, um, so, so with, uh, with with respect to aging, uh, we've been we've been working for a while uh, with with a group of investigators at UCSD and um, at Atlas Sapienza in Rome, uh, studying um, studying centenarians in the Italian village of Acciaroli, and uh, th this is this is from an article in the UT about it uh, about uh, um, uh, 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 that's a while ago now, seven years ago now. And uh, what, what often captures people's imagination about the lifestyle of uh, people living in villages like this? Um, oh, sorry, that's not what I expected to come next. Yeah, so, um, right. 
uh, yeah, sorry, it's 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 late in London, and uh, these are in a slightly different order than I expected. Yeah, so um, so understanding what uh, what what leads people in this village to be centenarians at such high rates is a really compelling research question because not only do they have very long lifespan, they also very have very long health span. Where even at age hundred, uh, they're often still tending their own gardens, um, still shopping, and that kind of thing. And uh, to get at the bottom of this problem um, uh, of the complexity of the microbiome, it's very hard to do it with human intelligence. And instead we have to turn to AI. And uh, we've had this collaboration with IBM between IBM and the Center for Microbiome Innovation uh, in a deal that was put together uh, between our chancellor, uh, Pradeep Kosler, and uh, John Kelly III at IBM, uh, uh, one of the VPs there. Uh, where we became part of the AI Horizons Network to develop AI techniques for studying the microbiome. And uh, what we were able to find in that project is that human uh, human microbiome can predict chronological age, where how well it does it depends a bit on what body site it uses that uh, you, you use to do it. But uh, from a sample of microbes, I can now predict your age to within about three or four years, depending on what I sample. And uh, we've applied, we've been applying this to the FINRISC 2002 cohort, where uh, this is a group of about 7,000 people who uh, produced a fecal sample for science back in 2002, and they're all in Finland, so there's very detailed health records on all of them up through the present day. And so uh, what we can do is we can ask not just uh, what does the microbiome associate with in 2002, but what can we predict going forward from the microbiome in terms of overall health? And uh, one thing that was fascinating and unexpected was that, um, so, so again in Finland, uh, diet is one of the main drivers of the microbiome. And uh, what we found is that 2002 stool sample, even 20 years later, could predict whether or not they got COVID in, uh, in, in the COVID pandemic. And the mechanism for this was, release, uh, was related to heparin sulfate and its role in ACE2 binding. And uh, what we saw is that bacterial heparin sulfate across different cohorts, including FINRISC and the American Gut Project, uh, was much lower in microbes that are linked to aging, and also much lower, um, much lower in males and females, which may explain why uh, the symptoms of COVID are substantially worse in older populations and in men rather than women. But uh, coming back to Chilento, one thing that often captures people's imaginations is this idea that uh, that the food, and especially the spices, um, may, uh, may may have a big impact on people's lives. And uh, part of the reason why there's a lot of hope that uh, dietary factors are involved is uh, if it turns out to be something about the genetics, you can't really do anything about that. And if it turns out to be an environmental factor that's only uh, that that's only um, uh, uh, that that's, that's only on the Chilente Peninsula, you can't you can't do anything about that unless you move there. Which uh, don't get me wrong, it's a lovely place, but it's not a very scalable or practical solution. Whereas in contrast, if it's something about ingredients of the diet, that's something that you could export worldwide. And uh, rosemary is, is one herb that captures uh, a lot of attention. Unfortunately, we didn't get to go on a field trip to sample it uh, for, for this project. Uh, so Peter Darstein and I picked some rosemary from the, uh, that, that grows wild uh, between BRF2, where I work, and the Skag School of Pharmacy, where he works. And so uh, what we did is we uh, chopped it up into little pieces, ran it through the mass spec, and then integrated that data into a 3D scan of the whole plant so that we could basically look at uh, where in the plant each microbe um, and each metabolite came from. And the metabolic repertoire was amazing. So here's just showing you some known bioactive molecules that are found in rosemary, including rosmarinic acid, uh, scatolarin, and methoxycarnosic acid. And the scale of these is that blue is the least of it and red is the most. And so you can see that rosmarinic acid is mostly on the older leaves uh, as, as, a uh, uh, as a scatolarin, whereas methoxycarnosic acid is much more on the younger leaves. And we also saw a huge number of unidentified metabolites. And here I'm showing you some that are unique to foliage with different patterns, either young leaves or old leaves. Uh, but there's also, uh, also plenty of metabolites unique to flowers or unique to stems. And uh, cross-referencing all this information with the ethnobotany of how particular plants are collected and used, we think is going to be a fascinating direction to explain um, why seasonality may matter so much if you're trying to put together a healthy diet, because when you pick the plant, it can have totally different impacts on what it contains at a molecular level. Uh, and so, so to build on this, we, we launched the uh, Global Foodomics Initiative, which is basically a fancy way of saying we took uh, thousands and thousands of samples and ran them through Peter's mass spec instrument. 
And uh, basically the idea was to uh, join up global foodomics to characterize what's going into the human body with the American Gut Project to characterize what's going out in the citizen science cohort. Uh, and then to do various kinds of meta-analyses that let us integrate the data to understand the impacts of the food on health. And uh, this is what's called a molecular network, just showing you the complexity of the data set. So each, uh, each dot on this graph is a different kind of molecule, and we colored it green if it's in food, uh, we colored it brown if it comes out the other end, and we colored it blue if it's in both locations. And uh, the points are clustered together according to the similarity of their mass spectra. So basically, basically, more similar molecules have a line drawn between them, and all those lines connect them into different groups. And you can see that there's not a lot of blue on this, on this graph, and this just speaks to the profound transformation that happens to food as it goes through your gut, where uh, essentially all of the green molecules change into brown molecules, and there's very few of the blue molecules that remain unchanged through that process. And to get at this in more detail, we turn to animal models um, in collaboration with Sarkis from Asmanian and uh, at Caltech and Victor Nise here at UCSD. So uh, what we did is we scanned a bunch of mice in a small molecule MRI to get a 3D reconstruction of the body. Um, and then we diced them into little cubes and ran each of those cubes through the mass spec for, uh, for, for the metabolites and um, through sequencing so we could look at microbes in each part of the body. And uh, with this user interface, we can highlight any microbe or any metabolite throughout the whole body of the mouse. And um, what we saw was a tremendous amount of microbiome mediated metabolism in the food. So for example, soya saponin uh, at the top there is one of the molecules that the mice eat uh, when they eat their soy-based diet. And uh, you can see that it accumulates. There's a red area of it in the gut of germ-free mice, but it doesn't get nearly, to the, uh, nearly the same um, uh, high, uh, uh, high concentration in SPF or specific pathogen-free mice that have a normal microbiome. Um, and then if you look at its breakdown product, so as apogenol, the mouse genome doesn't encode an enzyme that can break uh, the particular bond that joins soya so saponol to the rest of the um, uh, to, to the rest of the soya saponin molecule, and you can see that that derivative it's made in the SPF mice, but it is not made in the germ-free mice that are completely devoid of it. And this is one of just tens of thousands of transformations of food into derived molecules that we can see with this technology, where many of those derived molecules are known to be associated with health in some way. Um, and one thing that was especially uh, exciting was um, was relating this to bile acids, where uh, what you can see here, um, and I realize these thumbnail figures are pretty small, but if you compare each of these acids uh, on the left and on the right, you can see that they have very different distributions throughout the body and especially throughout the gut of the mouse. And uh, one thing that was fascinating about this is that we discovered dozens of new bile acids that are not in the medical textbooks and have never, have never been seen before um, by this untargeted mass spec technology. And so we were able to publish this in Nature uh, a few years ago. It was uh, published in 2020, where, um, uh, where, where the focus was on all these new bile acids that have never been discovered. And the count today is up to several thousand of them that we had no idea were in there. So, um, so to build on this, and especially to look at the importance of looking at microbes throughout the world, uh, one way that the MicroZeta initiative has evolved is to part partner with Danone, um, which has uh, sponsored a joint research project where in five different countries, the US, the UK, uh, Mexico, Spain, and most recently Japan, we're doing detailed characterization of a whole lot of individuals, as well as, um, as, well as sampling their gut microbiomes and relating diet to food in those different populations to see whether the same foods that give you uh, a healthier microbiome in Japan, say, are also translatable to the United States and vice versa. Uh, we've also been extending these results in uh, a large scale project funded by NIH on Alzheimer's, where uh, what we're doing is we're piggybacking on several large scale studies of diets that are known to modify Alzheimer's risk, including MIND, BTAD, and US Pointer, where each of these studies is looking at hundreds to thousands of people who are modifying uh, their diets in ways that empirically have been associated with low rates of progression towards Alzheimer's. And we're looking at the ways that the microbes and the metabolome work together to influence cognition and how diet affects all of that. 
And this just gives you an idea of the scope of the partners and institutions uh, involved in this project uh, that I lead together with uh, Sakis Pasmanian at Caltech. I mentioned earlier he's doing the Jim Friedman stuff and Rima Kadara Duke at uh, Duke University, who's leading the metabolomics. And one thing that's been fascinating about all this is uh, taking a more uh, a more global view of this. And um, this fascinating paper in PNAS a few years ago um, was notable for putting a whole lot of common food items on two axes. So on the, uh, on, on the horizontal axis, you have a sense of how bad each food is for you in terms of its relative risk of mortality, where one is neutral and then above one is bad, below one means you're less likely to die uh, over a given interval if you eat that food. And then uh, on, on, the, uh, on the vertical axis, you have how bad each food is for the planet, which is basically the average relative environmental impact. And what's interesting about this is the correlation there um, where the foods that are bad for you are also bad for the planet and vice versa, the ones that are good for you are also good for the planet. And let's just give you a bit more uh, resolution on what, what they are. If you're eating um, a diet that's rich in vegetables, potatoes and fruits and whole grains, um, what you're doing is not just good for you personally, uh, but good on a global, uh, good on a global view. And what all this suggests is that by working together in a very interdisciplinary way, um, we could figure out how to fix our food uh, and therefore uh, fix both our, about both our own health and also our planet's health simultaneously. And this is something that the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO of the United Nations, is currently starting to study uh, how, you, how you can take an integrated view um, based on microbiology that improves crops, uh, as well as improving, uh, so, so to, to improve their ecological characteristics, as well as improving their, uh, their human health, either if we eat them directly or if they're processed through food animals. So uh, in summary, uh, the human microbiome is intimately linked to a huge number of aspects of health and disease that we had no idea it was linked to even 10 years ago. So this is all very new research. Um, the microbial partners that we have in our gut profoundly transform the molecules that we take in, in food, and we're just starting to understand the implications of this, uh, but also starting to be able to apply it on a personalized level to tell individuals what they should or shouldn't eat to keep processes like blood glucose under control. Um, and so understanding how to feed our individual microbiomes could really understand our, uh, our uh, could really transform our understanding of all these conditions that we now know that the microbiome is linked to, ranging from obesity to cancer to Alzheimer's disease. And so it's a very exciting frontier for research at the moment. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank literally over a thousand collaborators who contributed to the work that I showed you here. Uh, the members of my lab, it's a true uh, privilege and pleasure to come in and work with every day, and our various sources of funding, including um, uh, including the NIH, the NSF, uh, the Gates Foundation, uh, and, uh, and a large number of, uh, number of others. We're especially grateful to the tens of thousands of members of the public who have contributed to the American Gut Project. Uh, so with that, I'd just like to say thanks again. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today, and uh, I would be delighted to answer any questions you have at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I will, uh, I don't know how many, since everybody is muted, we can't applaud. So I will be loud and noisy. I see Barbara has her, her thing off, so she will help me be loud and noisy and we will collectively applaud you. That was really a wonderfully interesting uh, talk. And I think it's a great thing for us to begin. And actually the very first question I see is from Barbara Parker. So I will let Barbara go first. There were some others that I saw in chat and I will, try to come back to them, but I will let Barbara go first. Barbara, please go. Hi, Rob, thank you. That was just a phenomenal. Um, I've been a, uh, I've admired your work for many years. Um, I'm, I uh, volunteered for the, all of us um, and contributed Wonderful. samples uh, over a year ago. And uh, I have not heard anything about the personalized nutritional intervention study as a part of that. So how do we find out and contribute? Yeah, uh, so that, that's a great question. Unfortunately, UCSD was not selected as one of the clinical sites. Oh, oh intervention. okay. So uh, it is being done at about a dozen sites around the country, but we are not one of them. So unfortunately, the only way to participate right now was uh, is, is if you decide to, to move to one of those cities. Um, but uh, the, but uh, one, one thing we are hoping, this is one of the first intervention pilot projects that's being run on top of all of us. 
And uh, what we were hoping is that if it is successful, it will be able to roll out to the entire all of us cohort, which would be uh, which would be really exciting for a lot of reasons. And um, and uh, with with a large project like all of us, in whatever respect you're contributing, even if you're not able to participate in all of the different things that they're doing due to geographical constraints or uh, enrollment constraints or whatever, we very much appreciate your enthusiasm for the project and your willingness to participate. Thank you. Great, thank you, Barbara. I was also a participant in that. I never heard about it. So, uh, now I have a question from Suresh. Suresh. Uh, hi, Rob. Uh, wonderful talk as always. Uh, so, I had a question about those experiments uh, with the germ-free mice, where taking the microbiome of a obese person or a lean person transmitted that trait. I was wondering, and you addressed it partly. Uh, the reversibility of that. Can you now switch it around and how long does that take and does it work? Yeah, so, so thanks, Suresh. That's a very uh, perceptive and insightful question, uh, as, as always. So um, with with mice, uh, you can... So with, with mice, we identified a small group of microbes that you can inoculate the obese mice with uh, where they have this low diversity community and transferring those microbes to them uh, causes them to become lean. Also, if you co-house a, a microbially obese mouse with a normal lean mouse, what will happen is the microbes from the lean mouse invade unfilled niches in the obese mouse, and they cause it to slim down. And that process happens over a few weeks. Um, unfortunately, this is also a really important reminder that humans are not mice. And uh, the leptin story is uh, one, one that's very cautionary for those of us. Uh, who, who study obesity, because if you have a fat rodent uh, for any reason, whether it's whether it's from overfeeding or from a high fat diet or it's genetically obese or pretty much any cause, uh, there's a hormone called leptin where if you inject the fat rodent with leptin, it will slim down. And so there was a tremendous amount of hope that this would translate to humans and that leptin would be a miracle cure for obesity. And it turns out that it is, but only if you're in the one in 10,000 obese people where you're obese because you have a leptin deficiency. And for the other 9,999, leptin does absolutely nothing. Um, and so that's been enormously frustrating. Basically, the finding is that although, although leptin is part of the circuit that controls obesity in humans, uh, just like it is in rodents, it's not a switch in humans for that circuit the way it's a switch for that circuit in rodents. And so we all we always have to uh, treat these animal models with a certain amount of humility because what we can uh, what what we can then apply to human health is is always very uh, is is always very limited. Um, a quick comment on on uh, 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 rat studies I'm aware of where uh, epigenetic changes transmit obesity or leanness to about three generations, irrespective of the diet. So this would be very interesting to correlate what your studies show with, with those studies. Uh, absolutely. Um, the, the, so Susan Edmund at MIT has done some very nice studies looking at, looking at intergenerational transfer of um, the microbiome as well as epigenetic markers. And what, what she showed in that study is if you induce a bad microbiome with diet, you can transplant it to other mice that have never been exposed to the diet and it will continue to elevate a range, of, a range of diseases in those other mice for three generations. Um, and so, uh, and, and so the, the concept that you could be doing damage to your microbiome or to your epigenome that's then transmissible and will exert, exert its effect in subsequent generations, that's looking more and more plausible. Um, unfortunately, those studies are very expensive and time-consuming to do because you have to track over multiple generations. And uh, I don't think she has been able to get funding to replicate them with newer techniques. Um, more, more generally, looking at those links between the microbiome and epigenome is an extremely exciting area of research at the moment. Uh, for example, butyrate, which is produced by a lot of gut microbes as a potent HDAC inhibitor. And understanding those links, I think, is going to tell us a lot. Okay, Rick Boland. Yeah, I, I wrote a question in the very beginning uh, be, because what, when you were talking about the mice and I was imagining, you know, that you could you could uh, clean up or re reduce the diversity in a human's microbiome and then introduce one of these, you know, a, a, um, <clears throat> a group of microbes that might have some health uh, impact. And you didn't talk about that. And I suspect it's because people are probably pretty afraid of what you might get into. And I'm wondering about the safety of doing 
an experiment like that on humans. <clears throat> oh yeah, well, well, I didn't, I didn't talk about it, not because we don't have data, but because I was asked to focus on diet for today. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think what you're uh, what you're alluding to is fecal microbial transplant, right. which for C. diff associated colitis um, has has been really very important clinically, including here at UC San Diego, where uh, Bill Sanborn performed the first one at UCSD just a few years ago, um, although it had been fairly widely adopted elsewhere. And uh, the AGA uh, Microbiome Center Scientific Advisory Board has been recommending moving it from an, ex from an exotic therapy to uh, a first-line therapy for recurrent C. diff. And the reason why is that antibiotics treat with about 30% efficacy, but fecal transplant uh, treats with about 95% efficacy. So if you have something life-threatening like C. diff that's very treatable by a microbiome transplant, then whatever long-term risks there are, are probably outweighed by that immediate clinical benefit. Um, however, if you're, uh, if, if you're doing fecal transplant for something that's much less immediately life-threatening, then you want to worry about all the other things that you can transmit when you transmit a fecal sample, including, um, including those diseases, those degenerative diseases that I mentioned, like multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, which you can transmit aspects of from humans all the way to mice. So it seems very likely that you could transmit them from one human to another. And so for that reason, you want to be very careful about how you pick your donor for long-term effects. And then for short-term effects, there have been people who died from a fecal transplant because it conferred antibiotic-resistant bacteria. And so then um, subsequent treatment of that patient for those bacteria with antibiotics failed. And uh, by the time the problem was detected, it was too late. So there are there are real serious risks to fecal transplant and still is regulated as a drug by the FDA because it's a substance that's known to modify human, human phenotype. And so in the special case of uh, transplant for C. diff, uh, the FDA is exercising a discretionary waiver where they will let you do it for clinical reasons. But for any other indication, you have to go through the full IND process, just like you would with a biologic or with a small molecule. So what, what's the longest, how many years or decades of follow-up do we have on anybody who's had a major rearrangement of their gut microbiome? Um, the first the first modern FMTs were done in the 1950s, and uh, some of those uh, some of those people had uh, 30 or 40 years of follow up before they uh, passed away of some other cause. So um, we're we're actually uh, here at UCSD. We're running a national uh, we're running the biobank for the National Fecal Transplant Registry, where uh, the AGA got funding from NIH to essentially uh, collect donor and patient samples from everyone in the US who's getting a fecal transplant who was willing to supply them. And uh, the precise rationale for that is to be able to do long-term tracking um, systematically for the first time, because what we, have at the, uh, what we have at the moment are all anecdotes rather than systematic checks. Um, what, what has usually been seen is that recurrence rates are low, at least over the first couple of years, though, uh, for most people, although there's other people where fecal transplant fails. And it's not well understood why or whether it's primarily a characteristic of the donor or the recipient or the match between them. Thanks. Interesting. Okay. I have a question from Sally about celiac persons. Sally? Are you still with us? Yes, I am. Uh, my husband has celiac. And I was wondering if there's any possibility in the future of using microbiome treatment by changing diet to possibly uh, help if there's an accidental exposure to uh, help the healing of that? Or is there other food-based treatments that could help minimize the effects of that? Yeah, so so that that's certainly a very good idea that there's been quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of thought about. Um, the gut microbiome is certainly known to be implicated in the pathogenesis of celiac, and also modifiable by diet. But what we don't know is uh, can you modify it by diet in the same directions that that would be needed to mitigate the likely development or or, occur, or occurrence of celiac. And the reason why this is hard is that there's large methodological differences between different studies. So if you see one study that talks about a list of microbes, and then a second study that talks about a list of the same uh, of the same microbes, 
if they use different methods, they might not really be the same. And the microbes on those lists might really refer to completely different organisms, even though they have the same name in those, uh, in those two different papers, or even worse, the press reports of those papers. So what we really need to do is we need to do a lot of systematic studies where we can ask with a diet intervention, can we change the microbiome in the same direction as uh, the directions that make the difference between disease and health for different conditions? And um, unfortunately, that's just beginning at the moment and doesn't yet offer any particular help for most conditions, including celiac. So it's something that's a very good idea. Uh, it's interesting in principle. It basically requires, um, it basically requires uh, a bunch of cross-sectional studies to look at the progression of celiac and uh, a bunch of longitudinal intervention studies to look at how diet modifies your microbiome to see how they relate to each other on the kinds of, um, didn't show them in this talk, but the kinds of principal coordinates maps that we make uh, showing how your overall microbiome configuration can change in one direction or another with interventions. Barbara Parker, your hand is up. Is that, yeah. How does Ozempic change the microbiome? Uh, great question. I, I haven't seen any studies on that yet. Um, okay, and then right were now. there other environmental factors around the 2000 or 1990 other than increased uh, ingestion of highly processed foods that may have contributed to a change in the microbiome associated with the development of obesity? In other words, is it all microbiome or is that microbiome and interacting with other environmental factors? Yeah, great question. So the, there are a whole, um, coming back to your Ozempic uh, question, at least as of right now, there are zero studies in PubMed that have uh, looked at that particular interaction. So I'm sure there are a lot of people working on it, but it will take a while before the results are published. Um, and I don't personally know anyone who's working on that particular, um, on that particular problem. Um, the, the usual cycle for this is that you have the idea and then it takes you a year or two to get funding from NIH for it. And then you can start writing your IRB. And then a year after that, the research plan gets approved and you can start recruiting subjects. And then a year after that, you have your data. And then a year after that, uh, you have the results in a form that you can analyze and publish. So unfortunately, the time scale for doing a study on a new drug is fairly lengthy. And one thing that we're trying to do right at the moment is dramatically reduce that time scale uh, with, um, with, with things like uh, pre-approved IRBs for blanket populations and, um, and, and things like uh, and, and things like uh, much, much more rapid molecular characterization and analysis. Um, let's see, in terms of other things that changed in the US along the same period, I, I mean, there are just so many, including, um, including things like regulation on advertising of drugs, uh, including new compounds introduced into the food supply, uh, including pollutants both added and withdrawn from the, uh, from the uh, general um, uh, ambient conditions like the reduction, you know, maybe the reduction in leaded gasoline uh, is a problem for a, from a weight perspective because uh, lead was used by the Romans as a weight loss aid, for example, and uh, maybe the lack of it in the environment um, releases more obesity with uh, otherwise unhealthy dietary things. So there, there are many different factors that interact and untangling the relative importance of all of them is, is a challenging and multidisciplinary project. So I don't, I don't mean to suggest that antibiotics are the whole story, but I think that the microbiome is one contributor out of those many factors. Great. Scott Arnold? Is Scott here? Not. Okay. Jake? Jacoby? Well, Scott had asked, how can someone get their microbiome tested? R right now with American Gut, we have been uh, focusing on cohort studies rather than individual participants during COVID. So we essentially, um, we, we essentially uh, ceased the citizen science part of it during COVID, but we are uh, hoping to be able to reopen it soon with completely redesigned kits and a new molecular process. There are also a lot of companies that, uh, that do it with varying levels of scientific rigor. And uh, so there's certainly a lot of options there. Okay. Uh, I had Jake next and then Nigel. Yeah, thank you. So <clears throat> yeah, I posted two questions in the chat. One was uh, whether there's any uh, data on, on uh, the effect of uh, traces of, of plastic residue that, that accumulates in 
people from eating animals that might be eating uh, plastic in the environment? Uh, and is there any, are there any studies looking at the effect of microbiome from plastic? And the, the second question I had was uh, related to the fact that uh, throughout the internet, you know, apple cider vinegar ingestion uh, through gummies and liquids uh, are advocated to stimulate weight loss. And I was wondering if, if there's any evidence that this in fact affects the microbiome. Um, uh, answering your first question first, there, there are there are a huge number of studies looking at um, individual plastics uh, of, of different particle sizes and chemical composition, and uh, different chemicals uh, on, on the microbiome, uh, not just of the gut but also the mouth and the skin, and uh, other compartments. So one study we did with Peter Doristan uh, that was published a couple of years ago was about the impact of personal care products on the microbiome, where we found that uh, that, that personal care products like uh, like deodorant and foot powder and that kind of thing can have a huge impact on the skin and oral microbiome. Um, unfortunately, we didn't look at the gut microbiome in that study, but uh, we did also see that what impact it was was totally different for different people. So uh, if you all use the same uh, exactly the same, uh, uh, exactly the same uh, beauty products, basically, which all of us did, men and women, for a, a two-week period. You didn't come to resemble the other people also using the same products. Uh, it changed different people in different directions, just like diet does. Um, so, so this, so this, this, uh, and we we also did a study with uh, with, with the army looking at impacts of heavy metals on, uh, on on the rat microbiome, where what we saw is that different metals had had very different um, impacts on the microbiome overall, and there was a lot of individual specificity. Um, I haven't seen anything looking at the effect of apple cider vinegar on the microbiome, but I also but I also searched just now, there aren't any studies that have been done that link apple cider vinegar to weight loss. So... I think that may be an internet trend rather than something that this uh, data is supporting, um, but uh, but I don't know about that. I mean, the problem the problem is that even a fast research project will take a few years, and so it's impossible to keep up with whatever uh, with with whatever is being suggested um, as as a trend right now, especially if there's not a large amount of scientific evidence backing it, because there's no way you're going to get NIH funding for that versus something that's much more well-established, like say the Mediterranean diet pattern. So um, so, so again, I'm sure uh, like as the cost of sequencing continues, uh, continues to come down, um, these kinds of questions will be much more accessible. And when they're, when they're accessible on the time frame of say a, a, a high school science fair project, that's when I think you're going to see a lot of the questions answered much more rapidly. But uh, we need to we need another order of magnitude or two cost reduction before that's likely to be feasible. Maybe not for high schools in La Jolla, but but high schools generally, um, you know, the budgets that you can pour into a um, to a science fair project are usually pretty limited. Uh, Nigel Crawford. Yes, thanks. The um, any recommendations on how to recover one's microbiome from antibiotic treatments? I remember reading a cell paper saying that uh, probiotics actually uh, taking after antibiotic treatment extended your recovery time uh, as opposed to not taking probiotics. Yeah, that, that actually was the whole topic of the meeting that I'm at in, in London at the moment, including the uh, including the lead author on that paper. So um, so it depends it depends a lot on which antibiotic you took and also on which probiotic you're thinking about using. So, uh, so especially especially in young children, there's excellent evidence that uh, probiotics, especially ones that are naturally transmitted in breast milk, and uh, naturally found in the in, in the infant gut, like Bifido, uh, Bifidobacterium infantis, have a uh, large positive impact on post antibiotic recovery. Uh, there's been a number of clinical uh, there's been a number of clinical trials in humans with very mixed results. And uh, overall, so 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 we're basically we're, we're basically doing a Cochrane style systematic review, and one of the one of the representatives from the Cochrane collaboration was here at the meeting, and um, what uh, um, what 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 we concluded is that there basically isn't a lot of evidence that as an entire class the probiotics that are on the market 
are able to do anything to restore the microbiome after um, after antibiotics. However, for particular pairs of antibiotics and particular probiotics, um, this uh, th there's quite good evidence that you can have the rate of complications or the duration of diarrhea or some other issues like that uh, if you have uh, if if you have the right probiotic tailored for um, for uh, what, what antibiotic it was that you took and also why you took it. So if you took it for H. pylori um, to get that out of your stomach, uh, you may respond quite differently than if you took the same antibiotic for a respiratory infection or for some other indication. So it's a bit of a complicated mess. There have been quite a lot of uh, encouraging clinical trials that have been published with more specificity, showing that if you know what the antibiotic is and why it was prescribed, you can do fairly well either with uh, particular off-the-shelf probiotics or with fermented foods like yogurt or kimchi or uh, other foods that naturally contain bacteria. And so uh, what, what, I'd, uh, what, what I'd say as a general guideline is that the fermented foods are very safe. Uh, you're not going to get any adverse consequences. And also they fairly frequently give you some sort of reduction in symptoms, especially for post-antibiotic diarrhea. And uh, if you're thinking about taking a probiotic, uh, you want to read the label really carefully, uh, where you want to make sure that they identify it all the way down to the strain level. They don't just tell you a genus or a species because that's no use because uh, all the strains behave differently. And you want to make sure that it's one that has some evidence linking it to response to your particular antibiotic, not just to antibiotics in general. Uh, I'm yes. sorry the answer isn't simpler and, and clearer, but uh, that's the state of the science right now. Well, is that information the average person would know how to interpret? <laughs> um, no, the average person should really talk to their physician about this stuff, uh, just like they should do for, uh, I, I mean, although, although, probi although probiotics are regulated as supplements in the U.S., you really want to treat them as a drug like they're treated in Europe, where yeah. instead of a relatively simple small molecule, you're looking at the insanely complicated small molecule with millions of subunits that makes up the genome. And then not only is that a molecule in and of itself, but it's a factory for making all these other molecules. And yes. uh, when, when you think about it in that context, uh, you, you might want to be a bit more cautious about just because it's sold in a bottle at Walgreens doesn't mean you should necessarily buy it and just take it. That, that's assuming that what it has in the bottle is what's on the label too, which is uh, a terrible assumption. So you probably re read the reports a few years ago about uh, sushi being dramatically mislabeled in New York and San Francisco, where only about 30% of the time are you eating the species of fish that you've been sold. And uh, it's it's just as bad for probiotics. So because it's not regulated and because it's really hard to grow microbes at scale, and um, especially in anaerobic culture, uh, a lot of the bottles, if you sequence it, uh, it's not what's in there. Uh, what, well, what in, the United, in the United States, shockingly, all the food additives are not regulated. Vitamins, all these things are completely unregulated in the United States. You could, they can put anything they want. Well, well, you know, you know, you can thank Orrin Hatch for that specifically, right? So, uh, so, so Utah, it turns out, has an incredibly high rate of um, uh, of uh, people working from home doing MLM for supplements, and uh, largely it was the MLM industry lobbying Orrin Hatch that got a lot of the uh, that, that got a lot of the uh, regulations around um, around supplements. And what counts as a supplement being uh, being essentially hands off by the federal government? Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, Diana has a question on uh, the appendix. Diana, go ahead. Yes, that was simply it. Did any of the studies um, shed light on the function of the appendix or not having the pun appendix? Yeah, again, that's a great question. So I haven't personally been involved in any of those studies, but uh, there are a number of studies that show that your microbiome is systematically different if you have an appendix versus if you don't have them. Um, however, these are all cross-sectional studies looking at people who right now either do or don't have their appendix. And there's always the potential issue that the process that led to you having your appendix removed might have a permanent impact on your microbiome. And you're seeing that rather than the appendix per se. Um, it'd be very interesting to look at populations who have had their appendix removed 
uh, not because of any medical in indications. So for example, if you get to spend a winter uh, in Antarctica, you are required to have your appendix removed before you go on that trip because uh, because, um, because they can't deal with appendicitis uh, like at the South Pole. Um, so, uh, so it would be very interesting to look at populations like that where the appendix has been removed without medical indication. But as far as I know, that hasn't been done. Um, there's this idea that maybe your appendix is a reservoir for microbes that can recolonize the rest of your gut if you have something like an infection that goes through and wipes out most of your microbiome like Giardia or Salmonella or something. But uh, as far as I know, that's still a conjecture rather than being based on any, um, any uh, solid study, especially not anything mechanistic. Um, I, I mean, this is a great discussion, and it really points to uh, how it is with microbiome research, where there's a huge number of big, important questions out there to answer. And uh, the cost of these techniques has dropped by over a million fold in the last 15 years. So the first time, uh, so for the first time, we can start to answer these questions and enable a large community of researchers to do it. And so uh, even though we can do more and more research of this type now, and the rate at which we can do it is accelerating, there's just so many questions out there to answer that still haven't been answered. And uh, that, that's why it's such an exciting time for students to get into this field. Um, each successive year, we know more stuff and there's more big questions to answer, not just uh, you know spending seven years to figure out if one acronym you never heard of binds to another acronym you also never heard of. And that's what you have to talk about to your relatives at Thanksgiving when you're explaining that you're still in school and that you don't really have a job yet. Uh -huh. Barbara, did you have another question there? Uh, I did. Um, colon cancer is increasingly diagnosed at a young age. Is there a connection with the microbiome that's been determined? Yeah, absolutely. So colon cancer was actually the first uh, cancer linked to the microbiome, initially in an observational study by Alex Kostick at Harvard. And uh, a number of different microbes in the gut have now been not just observationally, but mechanistically linked to uh, colon cancer, including Fusobacterium nucleatum and uh, strains of E. coli that are able to express uh, various genotoxins and a few other bacteria, where if you, if, if you transplant those bacteria into mice, the mouse will absolutely develop colon cancer very reliably if you give it a high dose of the same bacteria that are found in humans and associated with colon cancer. And uh, there, there are actually several commercially available tests. I don't know if any, if any of them are approved by the FDA in the US, but in Taiwan, for example, uh, you can do a, a stool test for colon cancer based on the microbial DNA and uh, basically picking up those organisms that are known either to be causal for it or uh, to, to respond to the altered, uh, the, the altered environment that you get after you've developed colon cancer. So, um, so colon cancer is a great example where microbes uh, are well known to be causative as well as just being correlated with it. And uh, pancreatic cancer is another really interesting example where uh, malassezia, which is the fungus that causes dandruff. So um, if you've ever taken an anti-dandruff shampoo, that's the organism you were trying to kill. Um, if that gets into your pancreas, like if you inject it into a mouth, it will target to the pancreas and cause pancreatic cancer. And uh, there's a whole lot of stories like that emerging where microbes that are harmless or only mildly irritating in one part of the body, if they get into your bloodstream, they can deliver themselves to organs where they cause cancer. And we're learning a lot about how that works in precise detail. Again, I didn't talk about that today because I was mostly focused on food, but uh, a lot of what we're doing at the moment is trying to unravel those links between the microbiome and cancer uh, and use it for a diagnostic. My specific question was the increased diagnosis of colon cancer at a young age. Does yeah. the microbiome help explain that or we don't know yet? Uh, I, I'm sorry. Yes, the microbiome helps explain that because uh, what we're seeing is that Fusobacterium and uh, Genotoxic E. coli are both more common in younger and younger people than they used to be in the past. And we, we also think it's part of the generalized uh, increase in inflammatory uh, inflammatory disease among younger people. So, um, so for example, uh, type two diabetes used to be called adult onset diabetes, right? But it's not called that anymore because it's more and more prevalent in kids now. Uh, fatty liver disease is increasingly prevalent in kids. IBD is in increasingly prevalent in kids. Uh, and all of that is uh, linked to overall changes in the microbiome. Although the cause of those changes, we don't know whether it's diet or uh, whether, whether it's um, environmental exposures of different kinds, 
or whether it's transmissibility of an altered microbiome or whether it's something else. Thank you. Uh, Jake, you have the last question. Uh, uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, so, it, so it's often considered that that polyps, colonic polyps, are are an antecedent to colon cancer, and yep. and and yet it's hard to imagine what the role would, of the development of colonic polyps would be. Uh, is there a relationship at all to changes in microbiome? Has that been studied, or is it um, too distant from the primary stuff that's getting studied? No, that, that's that's been studied. So, um, so, so the path, the, so the pathway of uh, of tumor development, where first you get the polyps, and then they start to develop into full blown tumors. Uh, that that whole process is what is initiated by microbes that uh, that express chemicals and enzymes that cause DNA damage in the host. So essentially, what's happening is that, uh, like chemical sources of damage to rapidly proliferating tissue in the colon. Uh, chemicals and proteins that cause DNA damage that are produced by microbes can also do that, and uh, essentially you get the whole. Uh, essentially, you get the whole progression pathway uh, being initiated by microbes, at least in animal models. Wow. Um, so, I guess I guess that doesn't truly establish causality for polyp formation in humans, but uh, given what's been seen in animal models. And uh, given give, given the uh, given the large cross sectional studies of uh, polyps and tumors in the ultra microbiome environment in the colon, I'd, I'd say that uh, that's considered fairly conclusive at this point. But it's not clear uh, what specific chemicals or what the chemical reactions are that generate the polyps. Um, well, it is and it isn't. We, we know which particular microbial genes are involved and how they cause DNA damage. Um, so then it gets back to how does the general mechanism of DNA damage lead to polyp formation and then tumor formation? And uh, that's not the part of the system that I'm an expert on. Uh, I, I suspect if you talk to someone whose primary expertise was in the cell biology of cancer, they would be able to tell you a lot more about that side of the process. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you, Rob. We've got you going to one o'clock in the morning. It was really a fantastic lecture. I really learned so much from it. I really appreciate you very, very much doing this. I think that there was a lot of enthusiasm from everybody in listening to you, and I think we could have gone on for another hour easily, but one o'clock in the morning, that's just too much. Thanks very much for doing this. Uh, I, I join everybody in a, whatever round of applause you're able to hear through the muted. Mic yes, thank you. All. Thank you very much. Thanks yeah, thanks again it. for the invitation and for a lot of great questions and discussion. Um, there's there's a lot of opportunities coming up to get involved in this stuff if you're uh, if you're interested either as a participant or all the data is free and available, and uh, just you know just tracking all these discoveries in the literature or as uh, UCSD puts out endless press releases about them. Um, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. So thanks for your interest in it. Thank, thank, you, you. thank 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 you.